My name is Tariq Qadoumi. I'm the executive director at Neom for the Lion Design Group. Um, I went to school in Michigan, got my undergrad and grad degree at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, immediately after that, went to California and started my career with uh, Morphosis, uh, Tom Main. Um, then went on to work in Paris and then the Middle East. And then in 2017, went back as regional director for Morphosis in the Middle East. Um, and that's how we got involved with the competition for the regional master plan of uh, NIAM. Tariq, welcome to your first Arc Daily interview. Let's talk about the line today. So could you please uh, share your thought process behind incorporating this line element within a desert setting? What inspired this creative departure? Um, I think our first instinct when we looked at the site that is 26,500 square kilometers, the size of Belgium or the size of Massachusetts was that the last thing we wanted to do was to repeat some of the regional plans that we're very familiar with, meaning that are we just going to spread many cities, many industrial cities uh, all across the region and connect them with an infrastructure that really kind of just becomes a web of, of roads and, and cable lines and so on that really kind of take over nature and take over the natural environment. Um, with that, I think the first instinct was to develop a city in the most consolidated and smallest area possible. And then with three separate regions, the coastal desert, the Precambrian mountains, and, and the Paleozoic uh, upper valley, three different geological eras all combined in one area, we thought, let's explore the idea of a linear city again. Let's bring back the, the idea of a city that is connected by a single line of infrastructure, a single line of communication and transport. And what if with that, you got off at every station into these walkable communities? And with that, of course, once you had that linear city, you could walk up to areas that did not require a car anymore, therefore did not require streets and, and, and that whole sort of uh, infrastructure that we've gotten so used to in cities is a thing of the past. And you literally walked up to uh, public realm, walkable communities that are mixed use, uh, where everything is around you. So you're talking about planning a whole city. Uh, in your opinion, um, has, has it been like, are there any like uh, fully planned cities that, that are great examples to look at? Look, um, a, lo a lot of great, and a lot of great cities um, have different parts of what we're trying to combine all in one place. Um, when, when you think of Manhattan in a way, it's not very far from a linear city. The island of Manhattan with 2.2 uh, million population is actually around a, a, a sort of a linear island. And with all the major avenues connecting these parts, um, it, it becomes an example. The other, if you looked at the likes of London and Paris, for example, you have uh, Take Paris and the Ville de Quartier, which is the idea of living in neighborhoods where you have your brasserie and your laundry and your uh, uh, pharmacy and your doctor and, and, and your school all within a five to 15 minute walk. We are, of course, targeting a five minute walk. Well, considering the predetermined nature of the city, how adaptable is it to evolving needs and changing circumstances? Because I know that your, the design is intended for accommodating a large population of 9 million people. Uh, what strategies or plans are in place to support the city's potential growth? Look, um, it, 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 it goes by the saying, the only thing that doesn't change, it's change itself. And, and in that respect, we know that cities betray you. You can, you can imagine, you can uh, uh, plan and estimate, but at the end of the day, a city will want to do what it wants to do. Um, so at the end of the day, we will have certain anchor assets. So the main hospital and the main uh, uh, music hall and, and these things that create around them a sense of neighborhood and a sense of character. However, we have a lot of the core real estate that is built to be adaptable. So things that would move from office to uh, institution and things that go from residential to hotel. And that adaptability is built into about 70% of our, of our city in order to be able to you know, adapt because this is a city for, for a very long time. Right? 
could you shed light on the core motivation for creating the city um, and the feasibility of it attracting a significant population in the Saudi context, like in the planning and development of the city in Saudi Arabia? What are the key considerations for ensuring inclusivity and accommodating a diverse population? It's a good question. Um, this city first uh, is a proud Saudi project. Uh, meaning it is built in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia with a lot of the talent uh, from Saudi Arabia in the making of the design and the construction and the management and so on. Uh, so at the base, this is definitely where it stands. Um, in addition to that, it's a global city in the sense that it will, uh, as the vision of NEOM states, it is meant to attract the best talent from around the world making it one of the most diverse and one of the most exciting places to be in terms of best talent, best minds, best thinkers, in order to push our one of our biggest agendas, which is innovation and progress uh, in, in sciences, in health, in sports, and in every aspect of the 14 sectors that we're trying to work around. Um, with that, of course, is the importance of having uh, every aspect of, of, of the population meaning you're going to have the higher earners, you're going to have the medium earners, all to create that city which is uh, um, less gentrified, right? So the whole idea is not to push a certain aspect of, of the population out uh, and, and to end up with very sterile environments. So a good city actually is very inclusive and includes both uh, the different sort of uh, nationalities, but also includes those different strata of, of, of the economy and, and of the population. Tarek, considering the high level of densification and the reduced walking distance, so from a 15-minute neighborhood, we're talking about a five-minute five minute, uh, um, instead, what are your thoughts on the quality of life and the sense of community? Um, it's funny. One of the drivers that we always look at in cities is density. So if you took London, for example, within a five-minute walk, you can reach about 16,500 uh, uh, people. Um, and that also means that you're able to reach the services that a city would generally uh, attribute to that population, a family clinic, uh, a nursery, and, and so on. If you think of uh, Manhattan, or let's say New York more generally, the density is about 22,000 uh, people per five minute walk. Now you think of Manhattan, you're very likely to come across a school in a five minute walk. You're very likely to come across a gallery in a five minute walk, and that's what makes the city so exciting. We've maintained that density because higher densities then result in crowding and discomfort. So we've maintained the densities of anywhere between Copenhagen, London, and New York. However, by layering the city and by building a three dimensional city and not tall buildings. Tall buildings is Manhattan. What we're doing is a layered city with multiple ground planes in the five minute sphere rather than the five minute circle. Now you have the same density as any of these great livable cities at any one level and the same comfort level. However, the proximity becomes really interesting because now within a five minute sphere, you reach 80,000 people. And it's not the people that is you know, the, the, the main driver, it is the services that one kind of attributes to 80,000. So you're very likely to come across a hospital as opposed to a family clinic in five minutes. You're very likely to come across a museum rather than a gallery. And so the city becomes much more performant in terms of uh, looking at the needs of the person and really kind of uh, bumping up that quality and that, that availability. Right? Well, talking about reaching 80,000 people in the current context of a post-pandemic world, how can we effectively manage the logistics of accommodating a large crowd in a limited space while ensuring safety and comfort? Yeah, it comes back to the same point. Absolutely very important. We've taken that into consideration, of course, is that the density is still the same, right? So in any one of the layers of the city, the density is still the same. We're not crowding more people. It's just that we're living on different levels, right? And so the management of people and the management of uh, such instances as that and many others that we've taken into consideration as well is just done by layers and by vertical layers that rather than just by horizontal space that ultimately we look at as uh, one of the main drivers of building this layered cities, which is that cities have gotten used to the idea of sprawl, 
uh, cities have grown from uh, having centers uh, built within uh, city walls, that everything was close. I mean, I always talk about people used to drop a basket and pick up their groceries and pick them up again. Everything was so tangible and so close and so buzzing that now we live in suburbs where people live in either residential areas or work in education city or, or work in uh, um, sports city. Here, we're just bringing back all of this, mixing it together, creating mixed-use communities, actually hyper-mixed-use communities, where we ensure every part of the city is mixed um, with hyper-proximity, not hyper-density. The density is the same. And by doing that, we actually, in layering the city in three dimensions, begin to reduce the footprint of the city from, take a 9 million population of London, 1,600 square kilometers. The alternative is 2% of that number, 34 square kilometers footprint for the same population of 9 million people, given the same amount of private space inside your apartment, the same amount of public utilities, museums and hospitals, and the same amount of open space in the city. It's just layered, right? What's your approach to the project's development in terms of phasing and construction methods? And how do you envision the building process for this project? The what process? The building project, the building, uh, building uh, process. So look, a 9 million population city is all of Greater London, for example. Uh, it's New York City with its five boroughs, right? So this is not a project to be built at one go, that's for certain. Um, it is a project that will start and we've already started on site um, and will continue to grow as uh, organic as any other city grows. Now, we think that we have the drivers and the um, attractors to the city in terms of looking at the industries of the future, looking at the livability of the future in order for this to be a very attractive city and a fast growing city. But it certainly won't be built at once. Okay, so a bit more on a technical aspect. Could you elaborate on the design's consideration of natural factors such as sunlight, wind, and environmental sustainability? Specifically, how is the ingress of sunlight into narrower spaces addressed? That's a very good question. Um, if, if you think of a, a house and how sort of light came into that, and then take that house and transform it into a building, just a high-rise, 15, 20-story high-rise building, you don't expect light to come down the shafts and to reach the lower levels. Light comes in from the sides and enters each one of the apartments. Here, we're taking neighborhoods and then we're lifting them up above each other. And the 200 meter narrowness of this city allows for light to penetrate across from the sides. And in fact, in a place where we have an abundance of light, one of our challenges is to control the light that comes in from the south side, which is the predominant uh, 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 a source of light because with that light comes a lot of heat gain. So in very passive methods of densifying the build space and around on the south side, we control that direct sunlight and we open more towards the north, bringing in the cooler light and, and less of, of heat gain. With the construction of a large wall in a desert environment, what impact is anticipated on local wildlife and natural habitats? Is there a strategy in place to address potential fragmentation and wildlife corridors? That's a very good question. So one of the main drivers and potentially one of the first drivers of the city is the preservation, the conservation, and very importantly, the rewilding of nature. Meaning once we've developed this city, we've uh, allowed 95% of NEOM to be given back to nature. And therefore, all of that will be available for animals, flora, flora, fauna, right? And people to go out and enjoy as, as part of their extended uh, livability uh, um, uh, world. And with that, the lion gun has to become an element as, 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 as you, you're, you're explaining, that begins to live symbiotically with that environment, meaning um, air has to go through. We, we often um, uh, underestimate the value of air, wind, uh, dust particles that carry uh, uh, pollen, that carry all sorts of uh, uh, living life within that. And, and the, the line will be able to have that sort of openness within the glass facade that allows that permeability and, and connection. 
Um, we also understand the ground on which we're building very, very well in the sense that it has a different hierarchy of both um, uh, 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 higher land, but also wadis that run, as that, that they have water that runs three floods. Um, and with that, of course, the growth of plants. And with that, be, they naturally become animal corridors. And these animal corridors then are allowed to be opened through the line and to make that connection from north to south. And can, could you share your thoughts on the overall accessibility considerations for this transportation network? Because I know that there is a very interesting uh, uh, network that you are creating. Um... In, in, in a sense, it's a multi-tier system. So to connect the entire line, um, London is connected through a system where to reach from one end to another is about an hour and a half to two in public transport. Here we're connecting it in under 30 minutes, right? So that's that's one way to make the city more performant and really kind of drive that sort of economic and, 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 and innovation side of things for people and, and companies and institutions to be connected. Second is uh, along that spine, we have a high speed network, uh, which is a high speed rail in a linear fashion. We have a, what is a metro, uh, 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 next generation metro system that connects every 2.4 kilometers. We have a logistics line also that connects every 2.4 uh, kilometers, connected to Oxagon, our industrial city, um, and, and port city. But then as you get into, into the city and at height, primarily it's a walkable city. So primarily you're going to be able to walk uh, as you come out of a station and, and access everything you need. However, there are going to be other needs for the variety of people that are going to live there. And so therefore you're going to have a system of pods that run at multiple heights, say at 150, 250, uh, and, 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 and above, in order to make those connections of one to two or three kilometers up to 10 more accessible for somebody with kids, with bags, with uh, 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 special needs, and so on. And finally, uh, I want to talk about cognitive cities. So basically, in one of your statements, you were saying that this is, uh, can, you t can you elaborate on the idea of what is a cognitive city and what are you building here? Sure. The first generation of enhanced cities is what we call a smart city, something where my services are done through the internet and where I can communicate with both government services and everything available to me uh, through apps and, and services, and, and it's basically a, a service. Cognitive cities begin to respond. Uh, they have a bit of a, uh, an intelligence to them where they begin to respond and the relationship becomes a, a, a two-way street, right? Where the city be, be, be begins to nudge you in places of interest, begins to respond to some of your behaviors and enhance that, that sort of daily experience of yours. Where cognitive cities go and where the future is, that's something that changes every day. And we're literally chasing that uh, uh, and, and I think we'll continue to chase it because this is where the world is, 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 uh, is going uh, uh, the fastest. However, what is most important here is that our city will be enabled. Our city will have the physical and the soft infrastructure with sensors, with uh, uh, all the right sort of fiber, all the right connectivity in order for whatever future the future holds will be able to continuously uh, uh, ride that wave and continuously evolve with the technology and 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 uh, and, uh, and, and uh, live with it and and, and through it thank you Tade. would you like to add anything else i think very quickly there are three items that i go back to one is um uh, the why and i think the why stands at nature preservation and conservation and that minimal footprint and to allow the rewilding of the rest is, is an example of how urbanism can sit side by side with nature conservation. Uh, we know that the world is growing from about um, 8 to 9 billion today to 12 billion in 2050. We know that urbanization is going to move from 55% of our current population to 70%. We know that by 2030 alone, if we continue in the same sprawl uh, uh, typology that we have today, we're going to need 1.2 million square kilometers by 2030. That's equivalent to, say, uh, 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 Germany, France, and Italy combined. We know that it's not a sustainable way to grow. We know that the dispersion of activities and the siloing of 
uh, education and healthcare and, and, and suburban life does not allow for a mixed use community. So all of that we're trying to bring together in, in one place. And that's around sort of the conservation and the minimal footprint. The other is about livability. We're trying to create a three-dimensional space with a micro environment that is much more comfortable than a flat city in certain environments. And, and every environment will have its own kind of demands and parameters. Um, we think the proximity will allow for people to walk, just like all the places that you love to go on holiday, where I can walk to the coffee shop, walk to the gallery, walk down a promenade and, and see life around me. So in terms of livability and accessibility and, and the, the equal and equitable access for everybody to the same services, to the same quality of life, that view that everybody gets from the outside from the inside to the outside of, of nature, something that very few have around Central Park, for example, or Hyde Park, and therefore that value of real estate is so high. Here, we provide this to everybody. The access to nature and the ability to like literally walk out into the landscape, something that we as humans have disconnected from so much that we don't even uh, remember the value of being so connected with nature. And then finally, the third bucket is uh, prosperity and, and and advancing sciences and technology and knowledge and, and learning. And with that proximity and the connectivity of the city, we're beginning to bring the city into the next generation of cities where cities begin to act very similarly to our phones, where I can switch, I can go from one neighborhood to another, I can go from one part of the city to the other and literally live a fuller life and where both industry and, and, and institutions sort of uh, uh, come together in a much more physical way rather than just depending on virtual connectivity and so on. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you.